Okay. So before we get into the plan, uh, similarly to Ms. Barone, I really want to thank everyone for your input and support uh, over the past five months since we had to, to close and transition to distance learning and during the past month-long development process of our reopening plan. Uh, we essentially took something that is similar to a strategic planning process that we generally would spend a year on and, and had to accomplish it in less than a month. Um, so it was challenging to say the least. Um, in addition to those of you who participated directly and formally on one of the reopening teams, we also received a great deal of input and feedback from parents, from students, from staff, um, as well as members of our, our community at large, uh, including parents and community members who are medical professionals. And in addition to this input, uh, we have been following the guidelines of the CDC, the AAP, and the NJDOE. And I think as, as most of you are aware, uh, there is no unanimity among these different groups um, or among the, the medical professionals within our towns and our communities. And I think that, you know, that highlights the fact that what we are about to present to you on our reopening plan uh, will elicit many differing opinions. Uh, as per the directive, we've been issued by the governor and the NJDOE. We are working hard to do the best we can to reopen our schools safely and in a way uh, that works to meet the needs of our students. The plan we are presenting tonight is our plan as of August 3rd, 2020. Uh, as you've seen, the directives and the guidance changes almost on a daily basis. And so we will continue to adjust and adapt as we get new and, and changing guidance. Um, and as we implement the plan uh, throughout September, we will also continue to review and refine it uh, because we know that, that adjustments will need to be made. Uh, and you know, we, we are committed to remaining as responsive as possible to the changing needs and circumstances, always keeping student and staff health and safety at the forefront. Uh, and that is why the first slide in our presentation where we talk about the guiding principles of the reopening plan, uh, the first thing we have here is the health and safety of our students and staff. Uh, we have spent a tremendous amount of time consulting uh, with our local health official, with the committees, um, with superintendents and in, in other districts uh, to look at their plans uh, to really make sure that that this is the uh, main priority in our plan and what closely follows that are our student learning needs both academic and social emotional and so that is what uh, we are going to take you through tonight and the way we've structured the presentation is we are going to go through the 10 uh, critical areas as defined by the NJDOE in the guidance document. But before we get to that, we know the piece that everyone is most interested in uh, is what the schedule will look like. So I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Labrera so that he can share that with you. Thank oh, you, Dr. I'm sorry. sorry. Sorry, Mr. Labrera, I forgot I had a couple more slides. Um, just, to give everyone, just to give everyone a little background on uh, the composition of our reopening teams. Uh, we did have over 50 participants across the six teams, the main uh, district reopening team, our communications team, our curriculum planning team, our special education planning team, our crisis response team, and our operations team. Uh, and this is just a list of the representatives that were across those groups. So we really did get input um, from a, a cross section of our community and that's what's going into this plan. And now I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Labrera. Thank you, Dr. Jewett. Um, I hope everyone is enjoying their summer, uh, staying dry tomorrow. Um, and I know that uh, we have a lot of, to get through today, but I just wanna like uh, appreciate everybody for coming on tonight and hearing uh, what we have worked through. Uh, on the heels of what uh, Dr. Jewett said, we uh, working from the directive from Governor Murphy about creating a hybrid schedule consisting of in-person and virtual learners. That was our first goal. And as, uh, after consultation with our committees and the aforementioned slide, feedback from our staff and students, parents, and in conversation with other districts, we decided or we felt that it was the need to create a plan that was synchronous instruction for our virtual learners. That in case we have to go out on all virtual learning that it would allow for a smooth transition. Also that we wanted to be in concert with our K-8 districts when possible so that our families would have children in multiple buildings that uh, everybody understands what each other is doing. Uh, also, we need to fulfill our NJDOE requirements 
um, make sure that we are meeting the needs and satisfying the requirements, whether they are the, the standards or the some of the information that was in the uh, road to re, uh, road back uh, document that we have to work with in the parameters. It was decided that it was at a, it was best to run an early dismissal uh, school day as to avoid a lunch period as there was just so many um, difficulties <laughs> in hosting a lunch. Uh, being that the state hasn't even figured out how to run in-person dining, that it was not wise to have that um, be on the day uh, or uh, for our students. But with that, we know that eating uh, is going to be a, uh, a requirement, not requirement, but it's tough for kids to go five hours without eating. So in, in efforts to avoid students eating at inopportune times, putting people in difficult situations, we thought it would be uh, necessary to build in a snack time to address nutritional, nutritional need and to keep the health and safety of everybody involved. So with these in mind, we built the following schedule, which was on the next slide. So as I stated earlier, uh, we are going with an early dismissal model uh, and to follow the New Jersey Department of Education for an early dismissal model to work, we need four hours of instruction. So we thought it would be best to break our day down to four one hour blocks with our normal passing time of 50 minutes. The only thing that is unique in here is that you see in the third time slot, that is the snack break that I referred to. And what that is, is half the uh, classes would, re uh, would report to a snack designated area at either the beginning of third block, or I'm sorry, third time slot, or the ending of third time slot. That is, there is a gap of 45 minutes in that time slot for us to clean that area. It is our plan to have that snack outside, and we have been working with the district to ascertain facilities that would enable us that with the purchase of uh, tents or outside facilities so that students are never eating inside the building. However, if it is a poor weather day like tomorrow might be, uh, then we would have to make obviously special precautions. Also, as you see at the end, we have a 10 minute dismissal to buses and cars, and that will hopefully allow us to revisit and make sure that the departure of our building is safe and that we're properly boarding our buses in a timely fashion for them to drop the students off and then to return to their other routes in the afternoon. So that is the schedule and then a couple of key components that we know that people are interested in. Uh, we are decided at this time to divide into two different cohorts. Uh, but in alphabetical order. So uh, we would have a cohort A and a cohort B. Cohort A would be in school on Monday and Tuesday and virtual on Thursday and Friday. The cohort B will do the opposite. They will be virtual on Monday and uh, Tuesday and then report to school on Thursday and Friday. In, in hopes of maximizing instruction, we will be in session on Wednesday and we will rotate cohorts for balances so that one is always in on the Wednesday and then the other cohort would be virtual. Students in our ELL and LLD program will attend school every day. And we know that we will also have a group of students that are opting for full-time remote uh, learning and they will just be considered virtual learners for the whole week. As I said before, we're having four periods a day. So we're breaking up our normal eight period day just in one through four or five through eight and these periods will rotate daily. As I stated earlier, we, we are looking for synchronous instruction. So our teachers will be able to stream what is going on in their class out to the people that are remote virtual learners. So that's why the uh, instruction will be able to be synchronous. So the teachers will be teaching the people in their classroom as well as the people that are on remote learning for that day. Uh, from that, we know that we need to have PD to help everybody grow and get better with this. And that is why we're going to be taking advantage of those early dismissals. And we're going to be creating professional development that would, like it says here, to build capacity of virtual instruction and also to figure out good ways to enhance collaboration amongst the cohorts when you have one virtually and one in person. And now, Dr. Drew, you can go to the next slide. And uh, Ms. Scheiderman is going to speak through to this. The daily staff schedule will be the same. Um, there won't be any changes to that schedule. So the faculty and staff are working regular schedule, certificate of faculty, instructional aides working 725 until 240, and support staff working their regular eight hour day. Um, as Mr. Libera mentioned, at 1215 afterwards, there will be time for 
uh, a lunch break for the employees, a professional learning opportunities, time for extra help for students, possibly related services delivered at that time and some other child study team um, activities. Um, the first goal of the professional learning, um, to, to really state again what Mr. Libera already emphasized, is to focus on that instructional technology piece, which there are some resources available now through the IT department for employees, and we will be conducting new teacher orientation, the two PD days, um, as well as uh, new teacher orientation, which I think I mentioned, and our two opening days of PD. So. Um, focusing really on that instructional technology piece to make sure everyone is equipped for the uh, new ins instructional uh, demands. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Scheiderman. Now I'm going to ask Ms. Reamer, who is our uh, Director of Special Services. She started with us July 1st. She is going to speak about critical area of operation number one, general health and safety guidelines. Good evening. So health and safety is one of our primary focuses on reopening. So with that being said, our employees will be receiving training on proper hand washing, how to properly wear your mask, our COVID-19 workplace guidelines, and how to respond to COVID-19. All of our staff and students will be wearing face coverings while in the building. Employees and students will be encouraged to wash their hands frequently. We will be limiting our use of shared objects. Our buildings and grounds have been putting in touches, hand sanitizing stations all over the, um, the buildings, particularly in the classrooms and in our entrances and exits. Um, any employee or student who are ill or feeling ill are advised to stay home and not enter the building. We are requiring our employees to wear their IDs so that everyone is visible to who's in the building and students are required to have their IDs on them at all times. Great. And I believe we're going back to Mr. Labrera uh, to talk about the first part of uh, critical area of operation number two, which encompasses classrooms, testing, and therapy rooms. In regards to the classrooms, what we have been doing is we've been going around with each classroom, seeing the classroom layout, understanding the possible numbers in each um, of possible enrollment for that class, and making sure that our desks will be positioned at least three feet from one another. Uh, we want to stress that in all instruction and passing time, students will be in mass, and we will have supplies in each classroom and in each opportunity or working space for students to uh, clean their workspace upon departure and arrival. Um, we are having our district engineer perform HVAC uh, tests to make sure that there is proper airflow in all of our classrooms. And as I stated earlier, we are um, in the process of creating outdoor temporary facilities, and we think that there will be many uses of these temporary facilities. One is to stage the students before they enter the building in, in the morning, and that way we can decrease idle time uh, of students in the building and also maximize the uh, efforts of the cleaning so that it is proper when everybody begins uh, instruction mm -hmm. in the morning. Also use those for outside snacking areas and also, when applicable, have certain disciplines that would benefit from outdoor spaces, use those for instruction. Great. Thank you, Mr. Rivera. I'm now going to turn over to Mr. Sabino to talk about our uh, therapy rooms and educational support services. Mr. Sabino is our Director of School Counseling. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Um, so for this piece, we wanted to focus on both the therapy rooms, but also speak more broadly about our uh, school counseling department, as well as our child, child study team offices, to what that would look like uh, come September. So to continue with the theme and the, and, the, and the requirement that all students and visitors will be required to wear face coverings at all times, uh, visiting uh, both those departments as well as the other spaces throughout the building, uh, we are going to uh, recommend strongly that all appointments are scheduled uh, in advance so that um, you know, whenever possible, there will be events, uh, as I'm sure many of you can think of, for both the child study team and the school counseling department when things, uh, when visits will be, uh, have to be unplanned. But whenever possible, we would like to schedule those in advance uh, to be mindful of the flow of the traffic in and out of the, those, those departments. Uh, revisions to waiting procedures, uh, we're gonna certainly look to reframe what it looks like to wait for those, for those uh, staff members. So we're not having typical waiting rooms with the individuals in close proximity to each other. Uh, and to facilitate six foot spacing recommendations. Um, contactless check-in for uh, students. So they'll be continuing to reinforce the fact that the students are utilizing their ID badges 
uh, whenever possible to check into these departments so they're not having to utilize our uh, Genesis system uh, by typing it in to keep those uh, contacts contactless. Uh, additionally, we'll be utilizing partitions in the high traffic areas uh, where appropriate. Um, no students will be allowed to eat or drink in offices or common areas uh, while visiting the departments. Uh, we're going to continue to utilize uh, video conferencing, including Google Meet for conferences with teachers and parents and guardians whenever possible, in addition to the presentations we will do uh, through those departments. In addition, for group, group sizes may need to be decreased to ensure social distancing uh, when doing therapy or group sessions, either with the uh, child study team staff, the school counseling staff, the student assistant counselors, or with our additional mental health uh, providers. Mr. Sabino. Mr. Emer, oh, I'm sorry, before we get to her, I'm going to go to Mr. Stiles to talk about transportation. Thank you, Dr. Jewett. And the first thing we had to do when we were talking about transportation was make sure we coordinated with our send, uh, sending districts, um, which is always a challenge with busing, mainly because of the, um, the tiered system. But we were able to at least come as close as we possibly could to make this work. So the first thing we're looking to do uh, with the high school students, and now that we have uh, the hybrid schedule, uh, we're permitting 25 students, and that takes place, uh, you skip the first row, and then you go two, one, two, one, and the three-seaters. And on the other side, in the two-seaters, it's one all the way down. Um, and continuing with the theme uh, that you've heard, face coverings are required to be worn by students at all times. We are boarding the bus one at a time, going back first, at back seats first, and then all the way up one at a time. And on the way out, they exit in the opposite order, and we, we have to do it single file. And again, continuing the theme of we're trying to eliminate the grouping of students. Um, the windows will be cracked uh, if they can. Uh, obviously, if we were busing tomorrow, that would not happen. But uh, yeah, so on, on, a, on the weather days where it's gonna rain, it's, that's the only problem we are gonna have with that. But other than that, the windows can be open. And even with the rain, as long as it's not a deluge, you, you can pretty much at least crack those windows. Uh, in terms of our rules about eating and drinking, and that goes with the face coverings as well, we're gonna be very strict about that. There will be no eating or drinking on the bus um, as that would be an opportunity for the students to take that uh, face covering off. And then the buses, uh, we're working with the bus companies to deep clean the buses daily and touch spots, uh, the key touch spots between routes. Next slide. Oh, hold on. I think I got two. Yep. Hold on. Uh, here we go. Tonight, you're making me dizzy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. So, and, and, and actually, Connected to the transportation is the student flow entry, exit, and common areas. So we're, we're still developing protocols to stagger entrance into and exit the building. Generally, the, the, the group coming into the building is kind of staggered, but we're looking to utilize the um, outside areas that, doc, uh, that uh, Mr. Labrera mentioned before uh, as a way to allow them to enter a space that's not in the building when we can we can look at them and make sure that um, we review their, their if they have any symptoms or whatnot. Uh, we have over 350 signs that we've ordered and we'll have them posted throughout the hallways, reminding students again the same theme, social distancing, hand washing, wear your face coverings. Um, it's kind of important not only do we have these signs but we as administrators, teachers, parents constantly remind students, wash your hands, wear your face coverings, those kind of things. Um, again, we're, we're trying to eliminate the gatherings in groups during hallway passing. Uh, we are gonna have to have folks uh, make sure we're uh, watching over the students. Uh, and then obviously the requiring of the face masks or fa face coverings at all times during the hallway uh, passing. Thank you, Mr. Sais. Uh, and so now we have Mr. Reamer. I'll be talking about screening PPE and responses to students and staff presenting with symptoms. So the district will be providing two reusable face masks and a face seal to all of our staff. 
We are also looking at um, some of the reusable masks for certain teachers being the ones that are clear so that you can see your lips and do some lip reading for our students that need it. The nursing space will now be divided into two locations. One location is going to be for isolation in the six student area, and then the other location is for general nursing. We will be doing screening on a daily basis. Staff will visually screen students. We will also have students and employees having their temperature checks as they enter the building. Parents will be asked to fill out a screening questionnaire weekly and submit it through Genesis, and employees will be asked to complete another questionnaire weekly. Anybody who is presenting symptoms will remain in the isolation area of the nurse's office prior to going home. And then we will be in contact with our local health officials about next, ste next steps and contact tracing. Which leads to the next slide, which is contact tracing. <laughs> so we, like I said, are working in collaboration with our local health department. So we will notify them if we have anyone who's presenting with symptoms of COVID-19. They will work with our school physician and our nursing staff to investigate the case. They will let us know if we need to identify other potentially exposed staff members or students, and then how to contact them and what the next steps will be, whether it will be isolation and or quarantine. Great. Thank you, Mr. Emer. Now I'm gonna go back to Mr. Size. Yeah, this, this was probably the most challenging of um, areas for us because we're trying to trying to add things to the building that would also not only handle this current pandemic, but also all scenarios. So the first couple things, we're, we kind of were able to do that. We were decreasing touch spots in places in the bathroom, uh, the, towel, the towel dispensers, the soap dispensers, the flushing mechanisms. And also classroom sanitizers, where we have a, we're adding a classroom sanitizer to each classroom, which is touchless. Um, those things will be valuable beyond uh, this current pandemic. Um, and then the second bullet point, where we talk about magnetic doors, and that, there we have many hallway doors that remain in the closed position. Uh, the reason we haven't in the past is because we have to tie them into the fire alarm, because if, if a fire happens, the doors have to be closed. So we're tying it into the fire alarm and all the doors will be open pretty much all the time. Um, and the reason being is it, it, it just will cut down the number of touch spots um, that the students will be touching. Um, and then the other items, our items are specific to this current pandemic. We are purchased or we have already purchased uh, electrostatic, uh, they're sprayers. So we, we've got six of those and they, they thoroughly disinfect areas where, where needed. Um, we are working with our uh, custodial company to add two day shift uh, workers. Uh, and then we are also working to come up with a specific schedule. Actually, we have a meeting tomorrow morning. Uh, so we will be uh, putting that together for the, um, uh, for the board. Um, and then for each classroom, we're buying large refillable, we already have those, these actually came in, large refillable wipes, uh, buckets of wipes. For, um, and this is something that we wanted to do for each class period. We're still kind of working on whether it's gonna be at the end of the class period or at the beginning of the class period. Uh, at the current time, we're saying end of the class period, um, but we're kind of, we're just going back and forth on that one. But we want the students to wipe off the desk and then we'll just toss the towel into the trash. Um, again, something you can grab and you can just wipe. You don't have to touch anything else. Um, and then we've already reviewed our HVAC system to determine the best airflow, uh, but we're gonna have a detailed uh, individual come in to do a more thorough review of the HVAC systems. We have 168 operational fans on the rooftops uh, they don't generate air conditioning and heat, they just generate the airflow throughout the building. Something that the board did in 2013 referendum, um, which added better airflow to the district. Um, but we also have heating and ventilating, uh, heating and air conditioning in many of the, of the areas without, throughout the building. And those will be reviewed too uh, with this, uh, this engineer professional. That's it, thank you. Now I'm going to turn it back over to Mr. Labrera uh, for the last three critical areas of operation.
So all this has, although this has meals written on here, we are not offering meals, but we are um, talking about a snack time. And that is a, a big differentiation for us. This time that we're allowing students to eat a snack is not a time for them to really be having a, a, a you know, a three course meal. This is something for nutritious sustenance that could be had in a quick fashion so that they could maintain uh, their attention in their day in proper being, um, you know, fed and ready to go. Like I said earlier, this would be at the beginning or the end of time slot three each day. Uh, we are going to be creating four uh, staged areas uh, that we were going to be dividing uh, the people that are in school that day and in each session so that we can thin out each crowd so that proper social distance can be maintained. Um, eating and drinking will be the only time that a removal of the mask is permissible. And as soon as that time um, they are completed, the mask should be affixed to its normal position. We are going to have students be the, uh, able to pre-order items from, pick, uh, from kiosks. And what we will do is we will station those kiosks near the uh, staged area where they are to go outside. As we spoke to earlier, it is crucial for students to be wearing their ID, pa uh, ID badges. And from this, we will be using their student IDs to purchase or to scan their pickup of their items so that we can limit the use of uh, touchpads. The good thing also about running a split snack schedule is that we will have a gap of about 45 minutes in between the snack times. So that would afford us the opportunity to properly clean and sanitize that area for the next group that is coming in. And then we move on into physical education. We will not be having access to our locker room, so we intend to maximize the good weather that occurs in the beginning stages of the year and have as many outdoor classes as possible. Um, we still would like to um, be creative with the lessons that we run so in that they will not be changing into clothes. We will have to be uh, cognizant of what activities um, that we are running that day when we are getting aerobic activity. Also, we will be looking in where appropriate to use a flipped instructional model where the, the teachers will be, have the opportunity to work with the students about the skill in the class time. And then the extension would be the opportunity for the students to go perform that activity. When inclement weather happens and we have to be inside, obviously we will remain social distance and masked at all times there as well. And lastly, extracurricular activities and use of facilities. First and foremost, all outside companies that use our facilities will not be permitted uh, until further notice. Uh, Co-curricular activities, we will be looking to extend those virtually and in person uh, where applicable and uh, by analyzing the specific needs of the club and organization. Uh, for our extracurricular activities, we've already started our summer, some um, activities have already started summer conditioning and we have the opportunity to run this through August 28th. September 14th begins the start of the fall season. This is a different revised calendar issued by the NGSIA and the competitive contest uh, will begin on or after September 28th, depending on the activity or sport. Thank you, Mr. Lambert. Uh, so with regard to next steps, um, what you saw there are the highlights from the very detailed uh, 70 plus page plan uh, that, that we have, uh, that we will be submitting to the NJDOE. Um, obviously, we need to uh, communicate all the different components of, of the plan to all stakeholders. So I'll actually be convening the communications team uh, later this week so we can talk about the best way to do that, um, you know, perhaps to chunk some of these different components so that we can draw attention to each of them because it is certainly a lot of information. Um, we do have to develop some board policies aligned to the reopening plan. Uh, as required by the DOE. And one of those policies will be with regard to the 100% virtual learning option uh, that parents may select. So we need to outline uh, the process for applying for that, what the timelines will be. And so that will be forthcoming uh, in the next uh, week or so. Uh, we do need to <clears throat> continue to plan for department specific needs, specifically with regards to the arts, science and physical education. A professional development for staff, as Ms. Scheiderman had mentioned. Um, we have made preliminary plans for that, but we, we certainly need to now 
uh, outline those in more detail and uh, really set up a timeline for what's going to happen in the remainder of August and then through September. And that includes the transition from Zoom to Google Meet. As, as we've talked about, um, Google has upgraded a lot of their features uh, so that they have a lot of the features they did not have that Zoom has. Um, and obviously, as we use uh, Google for our platform, for our learning and instruction, uh, that is going to be the preferential platform for us to use. We do need to uh, develop plans for our emergency drills, our fire drills, our evacuation drills. Uh, we did have administrators attend sessions with the, the DOE uh, and the, the Office of Homeland Security on those because those are going to be, obviously, uh, they're going to look a little bit different in light of some of the, the requirements with regard to COVID. And then we also will be revising our visitor procedures. Uh, you know, currently, uh, well, in the past, parents have come in uh, to the main office to drop things off uh, for their students. Uh, over the summer, we have been utilizing the vestibule in the front of the building uh, at the main entrance for uh, people to drop things off. And then security will go out into the vestibule once people have left to retrieve the item. And so we will be putting a process similar to that in place. And if somebody does need to come into the building for an appointment, um, they are going to have to go through similar screening procedures uh, that students and uh, staff have to go through. So we will be working on that as well. 